just uh, to remind you, our title is Research in the Era of Alternative Facts, Truth No More. So the five questions our panelists were asked to answer, again with a photo, were what are facts or are alternative facts in Kellyanne Conway's very famous term. Um, who can forget that? Who or what should we believe? What are the implications for research? What should the role of academia be in a popular opinions culture? And in 20 years, what will truth look like? So we'll go through each of these individually with the photos. Um, and for each of them, we'll show you all the photos together. So when I first saw this slide, um, I guess which one was Jerry's? Any guesses? <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly the Illuminati. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with Janelle. So, what are alternative facts from your perspective? So, this is a slide of the Heritage Foundation, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, but millions, it's a conservative think tank, uh, millions of dollars to misinform the public about scientific truth. So, this is one of their recent articles, Five Facts the Left Isn't Trumpeting about Paris and climate change, where they talk about how good coal is for the country, how the planet isn't actually warming. And it's written in a, a sort of scientifically compelling manner, and usually with some form of uh, a reference to a scientist loosely defined or somebody with some form of credentials to put forward these opinions. And so I think for people that don't really understand what they're looking at, this can be very convincing. And this, and, you know, depending on what your ideology is or where your beliefs lie, I think this can kind of create a different, a different version of scientific reality. So, Jerry, yes, the famous Illuminati. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm curious about this one as well. I wanted to convey the idea that we seem to be living in this post-enlightenment era where narratives count for more than facts, that a compelling narrative feels true in a way that facts need not. And coupled with narratives winning over, over individual facts, there's, uh, there's the idea of the uh, confirmation bias, which we teach to our students, that if you have a theory in mind, you can find evidence that it's true. And so if a narrative becomes viral or widely accepted, then people will find reasons to believe that that thing is true because the world is ambiguous and full of crazy stuff and you can find supporting evidence. So I'm a connoisseur of paranoid conspiracy theories. Um, I, I love conspiracy theories and if, you're ever, if you ever come to write your tenure case up, uh, you have a bunch of unrelated papers and you're supposed to come up with some narrative that takes all these things and says how really there's an underlying theme that unifies all these random papers that seem to have nothing to do with each other. And you're supposed to provide that sort of narrative that then you hope that the outside reviewers will say, oh yeah, I can see how these things link together. So one of those is... Uh, um, the belief that there's some sinister conspiracy of the Illuminati and you can tell they're around because they always have this symbol that turns up. It's like on the back of the dollar bill in the United States. This is the Illuminati picture which I found online. Uh, briefly when Dick Cheney wanted to launch the Total Information Awareness Initiative which was going to be this sort of orb in Washington that drew all of the data sets together. That was their proposed uh, symbol for it which I thought was uh, too hilarious. <laughs> uh, and then there's Fidelity, which is one of the world's largest investors in this giant financial institution. And what do you know? They follow that same Illuminati. So if you go in with a paranoid mindset or if you go in with a narrative, you can find facts that will fit it. They become alternative facts because they fit into a kind of a, a narrative or framework that you have um, that seems to be impervious to, uh, uh, to actual facts. I have another example, but I don't want to... Uh, use up all of our time. So. I have a great example too. We'll okay. Talk over lunch. Yeah. We'll see if we... um, okay. So that was fascinating. Thank you, um, Dirk. We've got you. So Dirk, I just want to mention is is giving us an art history lesson as well. So that's a fantastic set of, of slides here, which are really interesting. That I will let you. Well, you know, you us academics are good at writing stuff. When it comes to art, it can get it can get in any direction, so I just hide behind authorities. <laughs> so this is a picture uh, by the, the name Margaret, surrealist, and I think it basically for me points to the simple fact that none of us has an objective uh, uh, concept or perception of the truth. Even if we get very close to the point of an optical delusion, you know, it's a painting, it's a subjective rendition. 
Now you can ask yourself, why is that more an issue today than it used to be? Obviously, again, it's not new. Surrealists and, and Dali, I mean, they were even going far further down that road. Yeah. I would say um, a lot has to do with the fact that uh, people uh, in the last 40 years face more privatized insecurity as consumers, as um, lovers, as uh, students, as employees. Mm -hmm. And the way you deal with risk and uncertainty is that you create your own assumptions, how mm -hmm. to protect or when they will hit them. And then you end up in this lumen a world of autopoietic corners in society who have nothing with each other to do anymore. And that's, I think, where we are with this alternative facts. Everybody paints his own picture of what they want reality to be. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, the linking it back to security is fascinating. I'm doing some research on millennials and we're really seeing seeing some of that happening. So very interesting and beautiful photo. And Andreas. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're creating perceptions of truth and uh, before Jerry yeah. spoke about his picture I was about to take a selfie because my wife works for Fidelity and I was like, you know what you're working for. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're creating perceptions among quite recent perceptions that relate to all of us and I'm sure people will be tempted to look up as this is the ranking of, I think it's called the K-score of the Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and two other channels um, engagement of about 140 academics in the topic of CSR. I'm unbiased because I'm not in it, but for instance, Tima is in it, and I think Dirk's in it, um, and uh, I'm pretty sure you're in it. Um, and uh, but maybe I'm. Uh, and so uh, anybody can look themselves up on that ranking. Um, it comes from Bath, so uh, and uh, I posted that link on a WhatsApp group that is about African CSR, and the African professor is reasonably well rated in the top 40. And he gets tons of congrats. So it kind of changes behavior to a degree, probably possibly somewhat more short term, because most of these channels are very short term, maybe with the exception of LinkedIn. And it creates a truth about what uh, academic curious could be about. And if you look at the leader in that uh, uh, table, he is tweeting a lot. Mm. <laughs> and so um, uh, it's just an example of how we create truth in our own field to a degree. Mm. And then we, we might be interesting to study the kind of distributions of perceived truth. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Number eight, he also tweets a lot. But <laughs> yeah, you need to be in the top yeah. ten, you're probably most of which tweets. Most of them, yeah, sorry. Uh, and then also, it, yeah. and on top of it, it yeah, kind of... fascinating. Yeah, I don't want to take too much time, but there's other things with that. Yeah, no, but, but yeah. Perceptions, perception management, fascinating. Okay, so I think we've gotten off to a great start, sort of thinking some different ideas about what truth is. So I think our next question gets at what should we believe? Okay, so we've got these different truths out there. How do we start to you know manage them, filter them? Do we just watch Fox News and know that it's the truth or the equivalent on the left? Um, so who, uh, oh, Jerry, you're starting us off this time. <laughs> 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 Yes, that is the matrix. This is the moment where Keanu Reeves takes the red pill and discovers what the world is about. So, I mean, since the Enlightenment, I think in the West we've had this notion, uh, if you had an image of what knowledge looks like, it's that there are these surface things that are sort of readily visible to us, but then there's this deep structure. And that what we do as scientists or reasoners is see beyond mere appearance into what's the underlying grammar or deep structure behind it. And the quick way to do that is to take the red pill and you go from what you think you're walking around in the normal world to realize that you're actually a battery powering alien systems or whatever the hell it was in the <laughs> matrix. Uh, and weirdly enough, to make it even more alternative, um, the so, so what you're supposed to believe in is the deep structure, that there is some underlying truth and we can figure it out if we use the right methods, if we use science or some kind of agreed upon procedure to get at uh, to get at that deep structure. Taking a pill is a lot easier than going to graduate school, I think. But, um, but what's weird now is that red pill has now become a verb used by folks on the right. And so to be red-pilled 
is to realize that actually the Illuminati controls a world or George Soros is pulling the strings. And so it's now become, it had gone from this hipster meme about you know understanding the deep structure. Now it's used very heavily on folks on, I don't know, Stormfront or, or uh, Infowars. To be red-pilled is to see beyond the mainstream media and their version of truth to what the real truth is. So now red-pilled has taken on this different meaning. Uh, so I don't think that's what we should believe but it is what a lot of people believe. It's sort of this uh, interesting era that we're living in. Yeah, great, thank you. I've not been spending enough time on InfoWars, clearly. I don't know being Or have you? <laughs> or have I? <laughs> 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 um, all right, Dirk, we're moving to you next. With, uh, yeah, so this is a, a Renaissance picture, um, the tail end of the Renaissance. So what should we believe? And the big discovery of the Renaissance was basically to paint nature as they saw it, rather than they should have seen it in, if you go only 150 years back, it's very iconographic. And I think the biggest thing, which is beautiful here, you see, uh, the building with perspective, I mean, that was a big invention of the Renaissance. I mean, you have all these tiled floor, not because they actually had them, mm -hmm. but because that allowed them to play with perspective. So, and then you see the sky, all these things were very, um, partly ideologically, uh, through the church context in which art then happened, uh, not accepted. So that's one thing I think, see the world as it is. And we are still capable. But of course we are also, this is a school of philosophy. So I think deliberation uh, and you know, we are you know, dealing with, with differently constructed realities of course, what we have done today and yesterday is a good example of it. So yes, that's what we should believe. You know, I, what we see and what we come around with in deliberation with people who also see the world. Okay. But we would believe they had tiled floors. If they <laughs> that was fascinating. I didn't know that. Thank you. I told you, art history lesson as well. So this is great. Um, okay. I'm going to talk to you. Yeah, mine is not about the what, it's more about the who we should believe. So these are people from the Irish. Uh, independence movement, most of them were executed for their beliefs. Mm. And to look at the other side, uh, in financial markets, we should not believe are those with clear financial conflict of interest. The auditor gets paid to basically approve the statement, the credit rater gets paid to give a good credit rating, mm. the investment banker gets paid to find dumb money uh, that doesn't ask questions like the Black Rocks or the Vanguards. Mm. And so in a finance setting, it's pretty clear who we should not believe, which are those that get paid for their views. And then who we believe among the others is subject to us, but I think it's pretty good to say not to believe. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, okay, and Janelle, going to you, very, <laughs> a big picture view here. Yeah, so yeah. this is this is planet Earth as seen from space. And the first, this isn't the first photo of Earth taken from space, it was from the Apollo mission. And it had a, had a revolutionary impact on the environmental movement because it was the first time human beings really saw planet Earth as something that was fragile. It's this little delicate life support system in the vastness of space. So that was one thought with this picture. The other was Frank Drake, who's mm. a radio astronomer and came up with the Drake Equation in 1961 that is a way to calculate the probability of intelligent life in the universe and life capable of broadcasting signals of its existence into space. And so a number of astronomers and physicists have done work with the equation. Carl Sagan took it and he did various calculations and hypothesized that the reason we see no, we, that, that the probability should actually be quite high of intelligent life in space, but the reason we see no evidence of other life anywhere in the universe is because as soon as civilizations become or develop the technological capacity to broadcast their existence into space, they soon destroy themselves. Right? And so I think it's a chilling message for our day and age. We're, you know, in an astronomical moment where we've, in the last decades, developed that capability, but we're also, by all indications of the biosphere, in, you know, the planet is in decline. So. 
for me. Thank you. Um, we still have three more. The yeah, Anwar is probably going to scold me, but I think there's been so many great sort of ideas here that maybe, and we're at a bit of a break before we get into the academic questions, that maybe we'll just take a couple of minutes for some questions if anybody wants to follow up on these ideas or, or interject something before all these good comments are lost and we take on some new ones. Any thoughts? All right, yeah. quick question for Janelle. What's the probability of intelligent life on Earth? <laughs> <laughs> And I already asked you about Carl Sagan's calculation. So the probability of, of intelligent life it was if it's civilizations, and it was interesting, diff different calculations, civilizations that might destroy themselves, it was about 10. Right? And then if it was civilizations that develop technological capacity and don't destroy themselves, it would be in the millions. And so his conclusion was from this series of equations that, in fact, you know, the reason there, there are no examples or there are there is no evidence in the universe and agencies like SETI have been looking for decades um, is because you know his first hypothesis is correct that the civilizations destroy themselves so I don't know it's a chilling message though about what are we doing climate change yeah. warfare so does we like destroy ourselves for intelligence? <laughs> <laughs> When's the final exam? <laughs> That's fantastic. Any other thoughts, or did any of you have any sort of follow-up? Is that other second example? Oh yeah. Oh okay. Sure. Thank you for your service. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a weird thing, but there was a survey done during the 2016 election in the U.S. I don't know if you guys followed that up here. It turned out strangely. <laughs> uh, so um, so th there was a survey asking people basic facts about the economy and how it works, uh, and also their political affiliations. And so one of the questions was, uh, did, are you a voter? And the, so among the voters, did you vote in 2012 for Obama, who is the Democratic nominee and, and was the president, uh, or uh, the other guy? Uh, uh, Mitt Romney, and then they ask him a set of questions that are purely factual, not opinion questions. So one of them was, has the stock market gone up or down uh, since Obama became president? And the correct answer was the S&P 500 had gone up by 150%, which is a lot. And a vast majority of Republicans reported that it had gone down while he was president. And Democrats, 78% said it had gone up. And you can check on your phone. This is like 10 seconds. Uh, has unemployment gone up or down since Obama was president? The Democrats correctly said it's gone down. It was cut by half since, the, since when he started office to, to the time the question was asked. And the majority of Republicans said it had gone up. And that just feels insane that like tribal politics can drive information even when you can absolutely find with certainty the correct answer in mere seconds on your phone like whoa that is not a that's a that's a surprising thing so <laughs> i mean that's that's that is manufacturing alternative facts um, that can be easily disconfirmed so yeah, yeah, and and the confirmation bias, as you were saying. So my story, I was at the Aziz Ansari show last week, if you know the, the comedian, and he tells the story, or he talks about the um, scandal at Pizza Hut, where there's been um, pepperoni on a pizza that somebody's arranged in a swastika. And so he asked the audience to vote on, you know, are you upset about this, or so much racism out there, or are people just too PC and too sensitive? And he gets this debate going, and it's just completely fake. And so he, <laughs> people say they've seen this, and that they have an opinion, and it's just entirely made up. So nobody in the audience has seen it, but they still have a very strong opinion. Um, so anyway, that's what I was thinking. All right, so our next group of questions get into um, sort of how academics approach this. So the first one are what are the implications for research? Okay, so we're in this era of um, you know, questioning facts, questioning truth, alternative facts, and uh, this looks, looks like a fascinating start here uh, with Dirk. Okay, so not an art history lesson this one, but what are you telling us here? What do you think the implications for research are? Um, well, that's a photographer I like a lot. I was hard pushed which picture to um, take because first uh, implication I think is <coughs> to provide a picture of reality that unearths some reality. So if you look here, it's a photography, but it's highly arranged. Not only how the camera works, but also 
uh, how everything is cleaned up and so on. So I think that's what good academic work does. Mm -hmm. Provide, say something about a phenomenon, but say it in a way that makes it really clear what the essential thing is you want to unearth, explain, show, whatever. The second thing, if you look actually into the picture, I would say, yes, one of the implications really is that it has already and will continue to be very fragmented, that everybody sits at his or her little screen, does her little thing, and it becomes a highly fragmented uh, exercise. And that's probably a bit dystopian, but it is what it is. And I think, again, events like this are maybe the best antidote for this. Yeah, really interesting, fascinating. It, it reminds me of your, your previous photo too, in some ways, with the perspective and the squares. Uh, <laughs> it has some, some interesting yeah, annotation. Uh, Andreas, what is that? So, yeah, that's, that's about engaged yeah. research. Yeah. And um, the main point is that if you follow my previous note on who not to believe, <laughs> so then the question is how many people are left that you can believe that are permanently funded? Because it's nice to have an NGO that has one project for two years, but then has to raise more money. So the, the ability to believe them is a little lower because the company might pay the money. So tenured faculty is a pretty a good bet there. And then it's some religious leaders and others that are permanently funded and that are believable without conflicts of interest. And so I personally feel that uh, the need, personally, and I recommend it to others, to do engaged research. And so this is a evening meeting of the technical expert group on sustainable finance in Brussels where we engage in discussions about sustainable finance policy. Okay, excellent. So we're on the right track with our evening. It's only one group. It's 20% it's of that whole group. <laughs> great, great. Well, I, I love that you're in one of them, too. So. <laughs> Hearing our truth. Um, and Janelle, implications for research about food, knowledge, and how we've thrived on the margins. Yeah, so this is actually one of the reports of the Arctic Council, and so now their mandate, everything, every, every product of each of the working groups has to combine scientific and traditional knowledge. And so this is a really fantastic example that came out earlier this year, and it's, um, I think, making the point that Vanessa mm -hmm. highlighted um, yesterday that, you know, there's tremendous value and traditional knowledge about things like culinary inform how do people survive on hostile or very difficult landscapes. And so this, it's, it's I mean, a rich resource of kind of culinary knowledge and, and um, traditional history. But it also won the 2018 Gourmand Award in France for, you know, that sort of culinary aesthetics. I thought it was a really tri 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 terrific example of how to combine scientific um, and traditional knowledge. And then on the implications, what are you? Yeah, so I, well, I think that those are the implications yeah. for research, is that we have to find a way to, yeah. to reconnect with, with knowledge that is aware of the planet, that is aware of its boundaries, and of how to, how to live in a sustainable way with the planet. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And we've heard a lot of that echoed with both different work on place, and uh, what Tina's doing in Hightow and different people. So, of course, our indigenous guests. So. Um, okay, so Jerry, uh, see this one again. <laughs> I know that one. We have a little insight into it this time. So, Statue of Liberty. So this, <laughs> so, so this is uh, in the interests of sustainability, I believe, in reduce, reuse, recycle. <laughs> and that applies to my anecdotes uh, and, and my pictures as well. So this is... <laughs> Uh, so in this case, I was just thinking, you know, the, my, my claim about this picture is that it's a, it's a good metaphor for the way that we use simple categories for trying to make sense of a complicated world. Um, so we've got simple boxes and then we take them out to this world. And I think our theories also have this sort of confirmation bias aspect to them and that we have simple theories that we apply, that we try to apply globally and things can go wrong. So the most cited article published in economics in the last 50 years is one that no one in an economics department would guess. It's Jensen and Meckling's paper, uh, supposedly theory of the firm. Um, 
honestly, it's been cited 60,000 times. So the only close competitor is Hal White's paper on heteroscedastic errors. So really widely cited, but no one in real economics has ever read this thing. Ask an econ graduate student, it's only business and law schools. And there's something odd about this paper because it was published in volume three of a Vanity Press journal, the Journal of Financial Economics. Uh, it's the University of Rochester's house organ. And the, then the authors were the editor of the journal and the dean of the school. So it's basically a self-published novel that became the most cited article ever in the last half century. Like that just seems crazy on the face of it. But what's weirder is that this simple, this is a theory of the firm that applies to publicly traded corporations with widely dispersed ownership. Uh, and the, the question is, how is it that you motivate them to create more shareholder value and then they point to a set of mechanisms? So they're describing a situation that only applied in the United States and nowhere else in the world. Uh, and it only applied to a tiny proportion of firms. So it's like a theory of the, it's like a theory of the family that applies to the Kardashians only. Like why would you have a theory of the firm that applies to American dispersed ownership? But then the weird thing is once you've got this simple model, Model, then you see researchers saying, let's apply it in China. Let's look for agency problems and dispersed ownerships like FFS, as you young people say. Why are you applying this completely idiosyncratic American theory to China? For God's sakes, you know, understand the context better. And as, a, as an editor, it was always dispiriting to get a simple-minded theory that doesn't even apply in the US, but then going global to sort of do damage. So maybe that's colonizing. I don't know. But anyway, that's what this said to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love that you got domestic colonists. That means bastard. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, all right, so so that was all four for that one. Okay, so what should the role of academia in popular opinions in a popular opinions culture? Example, Twitter, etc. You guys, you've already brought up um, social media a little bit, so I think you're we're ready to tackle this one. But uh, let's just jump into it. And into it. Yes, so sir. we're tackling it first. Sorry. Yeah, that follows from. Um, those that you can't trust. So there's only a few providers that you can trust to really see if a company actually reports 100.0% of the score one carbon emissions or just a percentage of it. Mm -hmm. Most companies report the majority, uh, but that could be 50.1 or 99.9%. Uh, the CDP, uh, DJSI, and other data providers are paid by the company have clear conflicts of interest in reporting accurate numbers. Mm -hmm. So we stood up, and this was an initiative jointly of UCD and Imperial College London, and we said we have to do it ourselves. We have to reward the companies ourselves. We take the data that we can use from independent non-paid providers such as Bloomberg. We then verify that data and verifying the Bloomberg data kind of halved it, and then we uh, contacted 20 companies and said, we think you're 100% and you're the only ones worldwide, and would you like to receive an award for it, and you don't have to pay? And the first answer we received from a company was unsubscribe. So <laughs> that was very discouraging. The, the second and the third answer we received from companies was, we're very, very pleased that you do this research, but we're not sure if we are ready to take this award, which taught me that either they don't think they're 100% or that we think they're 100% or they don't think they can be 100% next year. So that was even more discouraging. And then about uh, two to three weeks later, we received an email from Aviva and we'd already thought someone else was going to reject this. And Aviva said, Thank you very much. If it's still all valid, we're going to fly in and we're going to receive the award. <laughs> and so uh, Aviva is an insurance company and financial service firms are a little bit better than the average firm on this particular criteria. And so this is Aviva's award. And we gave them to Aviva, including the former Secretary of Energy of the United States in the room in Dublin. Obama, Secretary of Energy, were there. <laughs> so we are trying to generate a bit of a buzz. The website is Climate 100, uh, sorry, Climate Disclosure 100.info if anybody's interested. And so that's what we do. Great. So are you going to continue the project? I'm curious. Yes, so yes, we're going to, we're going to, yeah, we have another one now, Land Stock Exchange, so, uh, and we're going to keep continuing and we're going to keep raising attention towards um, those companies that report 100.0% of the scope one emissions, which yeah. if you're familiar with greenhouse gas emissions, the basis for scope two, three, TCFD reporting and so forth. So we're trying to find the few, less than 2% that don't greenwash on that thing. <laughs> Great. Well, fascinating. And also fascinating that you got some non-responses or negative responses as uh, well. Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, yes. <laughs> and we have talk coming up on brown washing, which will fit into that perfectly. Um, Janelle, 
Great yes. photo there. <laughs> yeah. Just run up in, the in Barcelona. And so the idea behind this was that we shouldn't, as academics, be too reactive. We should be cathedral builders instead. So build something that will last beyond our lifetimes and has a sort of, you know, the, the effort and the planning and the rigor of what we produce withstands the elements. I love this picture because it looks like very ominous. <laughs> the cathedral stalwart amidst the storm that's raging behind it. Um, and I also love this cathedral in particular as an example because it's a phenomenal piece of architecture, nonlinear, right? Which maybe should say something as well about our scholarship, be nonlinear. Mm -hmm. so. And it's not done yet. And It'll it's not generated. done yet. <laughs> that's, that's very much like research. Right. There's still work. <laughs> There's still work to be done. It will never be completed. It's like your PhD thesis for, <laughs> for your whole career. <laughs> for your whole career. <laughs> but I, know, I mean, it is a cathedral that people have very strong reactions yeah. to. Though. So even yeah, though yeah. maybe we're not reactive, is that having yeah, no, it's why you chose this cathedral? Yeah, but, yeah, it was also, it's kind of, you, you either love it or hate it, but it yeah. doesn't matter. Right, like it didn't matter to Gaudi if you loved it or hated it. It wasn't for you in a way. Like it is for you, but it's not. So I think, I think that idea, like you have to have truth of conviction in what you're doing in your own work. Okay. And build it over a very long time span. That's why we should get rid of our teaching writings, right? Yeah. Gaudi had had teaching writings. Yeah, I mean, the latest thing at MIT is an urban science major, which I we, we were talking yeah. about. This I think is a good idea. It's kind of responding to the trend towards big data. But then I, was, I also wanted to say, reject the technology. I'm like, you reject the technology. Just do good scholarship. And that's not going to fly. But anyway, there's the cathedral. <laughs> and it will stand the test of time. Yeah, great, great analogy. I love it. Um, so, Jerry, we've got uh, one of the many floods of the late, I assume. This is uh, yes. New Orleans uh, New during Orleans, Hurricane okay. Katrina. And, uh, that is where the levee broke. So mm -hmm. this is the river, and this is that little swath there uh, is where the levee broke and flooded the city. So the levee is a human construction meant to keep nature at bay. And I think this is the Ninth Ward. And so that was where the levee broke and then just flooded the entire city. And so uh, the muddy Mississippi is kind of like the world of, uh, of, of uh, craziness and non-factual information. I think in this metaphor, academics are supposed to be like the levee that sort of provides this solid barrier. And behind this is where the factual information is. And then the other side is where the nonsense is. And we're sort of holding this line against a flood of, of fake facts uh, and, and silliness. The place where the levee breaks uh, is the uh, the replication crisis or the concerns that one has. I was a, a, edited this journal for five years um, and dug in a lot into what's going wrong with our practices uh, as social scientists and scientists and what's wrong with the incentive system, the journal publication system, and, and why we have these incentives to come up with power posing or th things that don't really necessarily count as great science. There's a lot of incentives to do it quickly, unlike Gaudi. <laughs> uh, this is kind of the opposite in some sense to, 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 to your analogy. This is like when we go for quick wins or things that are highly visible or counterintuitive that we come to no longer be trusted as sources of knowledge, that we kind of we're kind of polluting our own nest in a way that makes it difficult to say we're the ones that stand for truth and it's that other thing that's nonsense. And it's harder to maintain that, that levy or that line, I think, given what's going on in the sciences today. So. Interesting. Hmm? Interesting. Of course, Andre has posted our uh, Twitter rankings, our social media rankings. So <laughs> the, the very same pressures you're talking about. So hmm. get, get to number one spot on the rankings. So, uh, Dirk, we've got a, another fascinating. Yeah. So um, yeah. this this picture was actually in my office when I wrote my PhD, reminding me what I thought <laughs> is what good academic work is: working hard, you know, sweating like these guys, using all your muscles to unearth something of reality. I think that's what we do, and I think it's. It goes in a different direction than the cathedral, but it's essentially similar. It's, I think that's the essence of what we do. We, we, we say something intersubjectively reproducible about reality. 
and that dis differentiates us from artists. And this particular guy, I quite like. He's a he's a neo impressionist, so he painted after Monet. And you know, there isn't hardly an airline lounge in the world where you see water lilies, right? <laughs> so his previous <laughs> train of thought, they were Seurat, Pointillisme, these were beautiful pictures. But that wasn't what he was interested. He focused on the hard work. It's a beautiful room. He could have painted the room and that would have been a beautiful picture. No, he, he focused on the, on the essential work that leads to beauty. Uh -huh. And I think that's how I see the role of academics. Mm -hmm in a culture which is very easy to distract. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have Twitter accounts and you know do this stuff. But what is it what we are talking about? What is it what we bring to this popular opinion cultures? I think it's this. Interesting. Interesting. And does the fact that it's they're scraping off the floor varnish, which has clearly covered up the beauty by somebody exactly. does that have some yeah so some previous iteration obviously was wood and it was covered up and now it's being exposed. There's some, anyway, we could get into that. Maybe that's a discussion over cocktails. <laughs> what does the varnish symbolize? <laughs> okay, um, so thank you all for that. That was great. So this is our last question. We'll sum it up and then we'll open it up for some questions before, uh, before lunch. We understand we're standing between you and your lunch. So. Um, so in 20 years, what will truth look like? So asking you to, to go out into the, the distance. I think if you're, our, our cathedral will last, so it might look the same. I don't know. We'll see what you don't think. But, um, and we're starting with you, actually. So here we go. There we go. So, you know, this I actually, it's, it was a series of pictures, and it's not mine, but I thought this was fascinating. There was a study done of Americans, 5,000 Americans, and it asked them to, using you know, this kind of brackets of the quintiles of the economy, distribute the wealth of America according to what they believed was the reality. And you probably just can barely see it on this image, but that's this first um, white line that's kind of going up to the top is what Americans believed was the wealth in society. And then it asked them what was their ideal. And so the ideal is this other more even line where you have maybe 10 to 20 percent of the wealth, or 10 to 20 times more of the wealth in the upper quintile, but still a pretty even distribution across the quintiles. And then this is the graphic that shows the reality, right, where you know, the, the top, never mind the top quintile, but the top 1 percent is so large it needs an entire bracket of its own. And 40% of the wealth in the United States is held by the top 1%. And then I thought the most telling aspect of this study, though, was that the 1% population in the United States owns 50% of the stocks, bonds, bonds, mutual funds, instruments of finance. And 50% of Americans, the lower 50%, own only 0.5%. So half of a share of the world's financial instruments. And so I think this is telling because it says something more broadly about where wealth inequality is coming from and about the growth of um, wealth inequality and even of the, the growth of wealth in the United States. It's in financial instruments. It's not a wealth grounded in materiality. And so I know this is kind of a stretch to what does this look like in 20 years? What does truth look like? But I think that unevenness of the production of the economy is very much related to what's happening in other areas of other disciplines and other areas of operation. And it has ramifications for what's happening in the academy as well. Mm -hmm. Particularly, I mean, maybe not even necessarily in the traditional academy, but this idea of who's producing truth. Mm -hmm. So the capacity to overwhelm academic institutions or a conventional scientific process is very much tied to this figure. And so I, you know, I, the, I started with the Heritage Foundation. And this is something, I think the Koch brothers are one of the big funders of the Heritage Foundation. They're also big supporters of MIT, you know, mm -hmm. ironically enough, but there you go. There's some, you know, if, if truth can be bought, here is where it will be bought. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. I can hear Jerry agreeing, I think, so you know, it's our last <laughs> round. Feel free to, yeah, jump in and, and chime in with for, each other. For me, scientifically, from a financial market perspective, that doesn't square up these charts because hmm. securities are owned largely by institutional investors, so it's the biggest pension funds and the biggest insurances. And the wealth of an individual, even the richest individual, is very little compared with Calpers, Kelsters, and the big insurance funds. So while I'm, I think the broad relationship is there, but this that 1% own that much compared to everybody else, I believe that is more the think tanks that produce these charts 
um, that have a bit of a personal interest in that direction. So I think when you scientifically look who owns the securities and then you split up pension funds on individuals mm -hmm. and insurance on individuals, I think you're right that those that don't have pensions and don't, that don't have insurance will have nothing. But it's not that 1% of individuals have that much. Um, I, I personally don't see these numbers as <coughs> fully accurate. Well, this well, checks out to me, though, that the, the, the Fed does a, a, a survey every three years, a survey of consumer finances, and this would square pretty much with that. So this is asking at the household level, uh, how much do you own in stocks, bonds, uh, other financial instruments? So if I own a BlackRock ETF and I own a billion dollars of it, I'm going to report a billion dollars, and the people in the bottom 50% will report zero. So if you survey at the household level, this this seems not implausible to me. There's think, another nice graphic that kind of puts this in perspective. And again, I should have, this is just the picture because I yeah. had to take out the sources and everything. I probably should have sent all of that as a unified image. But there is a lot of data to support this. And I mean, fair enough, I haven't extensively dug through the data. But there's a picture of Jeff Bezos' income last year. And it was like $32 billion in one year. That was his income. And there's 2,000 billionaires in the world now. Yeah, that, that wasn't his income. That was the appreciation of Amazon, which when it drops, it's gone again. So, so I think, personally, if you only take the consumer finances, I think it, that probably squares because many people own very little retail funds. But if you include the pension pot, it doesn't square anymore. It may be that in the US, which is different from Europe, it squares if you deduct all the loans and the debt they have. That one I can't say. But certainly from a European perspective, I don't think... That would be the extreme. Find the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably how truth looks like. Yeah. <laughs> Perceived. Uh, you can download the survey of consumer finances data if you like and run regressions. It's it's very publicly accessible, so you can you can check. Yeah, so the pension fund data. Yeah. yeah. Before the conference next year, I should we'll find the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Report back. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. That was really interesting. And, and Jerry, you have a, a facade here from Ann Arbor. I, I, I have a facade, so I'm glad that there's uh, someone from urban planning and architecture who can help us sort of explain this stuff. So this is kind of the bookend to the uh, uh, to the uh, matrix picture. You know, I claim that the enlightenment claim is that there's a there's a surface and then there's a deep structure to it. And it seems to me that built into capitalism is a set of pressures that lead us to valorize the facade and not look too deeply into what's behind it. So if you wander around a lot of big cities, London is like this, Washington, DC, uh, the fronts of the buildings look like it's 1850 and it's these old townhouses and so on. And then you walk inside and it's completely transformed and they have glass roofs. And, and what, what happens is that architects, maybe at the behest of, uh, of urban planning commission say, you have to maintain the historical character of this neighborhood, even though, even as you completely change what's behind it. And so this was a Carnegie Library in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and the, the folks that were building the dorm that was going up there were told, but you have to preserve this historically important Carnegie Library. And the compromise is you save only the front and everything else is completely new construction. And so you can wander around a world that's kind of like Disneyland, where you've got these facades or, you know, Potemkin Village. You've got these surfaces that make you feel like you're seeing those old familiar uh, institutions. But behind it, everything's new and unfamiliar. So maybe there really isn't any truth behind it. Maybe we wander into this world where facades are valued over sort of the depth behind it. So that's the psychedelic thing there. <laughs> <laughs> and earlier we had Keynesian Disneyland, and it is Ann Arbor. Was that your term? <laughs> it is Ann Arbor, so um, yeah, fascinating. That's I, I hadn't seen it in construction. I've seen it now, and this is it's very hard to even see. So yeah. The way they did it, it's it's you know not kind of making it a standout piece of that building. It's sort of by the shipping dock or something. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's uh, yeah, definitely did it. Oh, yeah, okay, we've all been curious about this one. <laughs> We're looking forward to it. Well, a little look inside. It's, it's very simple. I think I have, I'm very uh, 
worried about a lot of things, but I'm not worried about one thing, and I don't know what truth in 20 years will exactly look like, but the human condition will always be the same. I, I lived in a country, we had nine years of pretty heavy truth uh, manipulation in the last century. That didn't last. Half of it lived 40 more years in another world where the truth was heavily uh, manipulated, didn't last. I'm pretty optimistic that the human condition and you know the way we feel about our bodies, the way we react to it, interact, would pretty much be the same. Of course, I mean, and this is interesting, Liechtenstein uh, um, was at the end of the pop at least this series, after Andy Warhol's uh, Tomato Soup, after Rauschenberg, Oldenburg, all these other guys who have very much painted a fairly sober, commercialized reality of popular culture. And here he tells us a different story. Of course, with the kind of um, pattern, um, the blue dots, it has a particular popular culture, temporary, um, appearance. I think that will be the case in 20 years too. What that will be, I have no idea. But I'm pretty optimistic about the human condition in the long term. Maybe. Wrap us up. I hmm? think there will probably be some questions about the human condition here. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, maybe we'll just finish off, Please. Andreas, and then we can come back Please. to the human condition in just a second. I think you provoked some thinking, so we'll let you uh, ponder it for just a couple of minutes. Yeah, so okay. the only statement I can make with some confidence is that okay. you don't find the truth. I, I personally think one needs to keep searching. So, and in a quest to keep searching, if I can recommend one thing, this is a Tristan Harris video that we discussed at dinner um, uh, two days ago. So Tristan Harris, has anybody seen Tristan Harris' video on uh, news feeds and how they potentially manipulate? See, that's stunning. So I saw that video by chance and then I asked on LinkedIn and on, on WhatsApp, lots of friends if they'd seen it, even friends that work in tech, even friends that work in tech on the West Coast and hadn't seen it. So this is a video, it's a TED talk that criticizes news feeds and how they manipulate our minds. So in that sense, uh, Facebook or uh, uh, Twitter is a very different thing from WhatsApp. WhatsApp is raw, whatever your friends want to send us. Facebook and uh, uh, Twitter is what they want to send you. And so the question then arises is, does the newsfeed represent, uh, recommend the video that criticizes the newsfeed? <laughs> and it appears that the newsfeed doesn't seem to do that or all of the people overlook it. So it is, Google uh, does uh, recommend it. You only need to search uh, Tristan Harris newsfeed and you get it. It's 20 minutes like any TED talk. And it's, in my view, extremely enlightening. Fantastic. Okay. I think uh, there was so, uh, a few questions brewing out in the audience, especially, uh, yeah, lots of provocative stuff here. So any last, any, any thoughts? The human condition? Well, is it going to be the same in 20 years? Karen's got some thoughts. I, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that? Why do you think that the human condition will, will remain? That's all the evidence I have. Yeah. And I, 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 would, I would add, um, and that's why I picked the picture in part, uh, that it has a lot to do with our physical existence. And that has been pretty constant as far as we at least know our stage of evolution, right? So, um, well, I'm pretty optimistic. I had actually kind of a, a follow up that because I agree the physical condition, but what I see now is that uh, people can manipulate the cognitive processes more than they could have as far as I can see in the past. And it can be, you know, probably through news feed, but what you can do with virtual reality. It's something that is uh, qualitatively different, I feel, than what has happened in the past. Before, what we what we, you know, what happened to our bodies, we understood there was pain, there was pleasure, things that we can see. But this is this seems like something different, and I'm wondering if you um, what you think about that. I agree. I mean, I don't know exactly the shape. I mean, that's why I picked this this pop art picture. You know, uh, if it didn't say seductive girl, I wouldn't probably have thought that. You know, it's very much alienated the way it's painted. You know, it's a comic. <laughs> You know, cartoonish reduction and the way color plays. I'm 
I'm 100% sure that the conditions and the filters through which we will live and, and enact our humanity might indeed change and that technology might be a, a huge game changer, more than we think. Mm. But at the end of the day, I don't think um, this will um, change the basic way we consume, we interact, we prefer, we relate and so on. Mm. And maybe I'm an optimist here. We interact, we relate and consume. Basic, yes. We will always eat. There's a very interesting article, I think it was the last issue of The Atlantic, and it, the title page was The Sex Recession. Mm. And just talking and looking at your girl and everything else. But really, you know, again, you can take it for what it is, but somebody saying, you know what? This world is changing. People don't want to have contact with each other anymore. And they're not having sex as much as they were anymore. And all of this stuff that where we think that you know, people are having all sorts of sex, and this, you know, these apps and so on, you know, no, it's not actually happening. And so it's quite stunning to me to read it. And whether it's true or not, I don't know. It's somebody's, somebody's supposition. So that's kind of questioning what you're saying in a sense. Saying, yeah, people can't be bothered to be in touch with other people. It's too much trouble. Or yeah. you buy those dolls now. So, <laughs> and you can grow the show. CBC has a documentary on the sex dolls. Excellent documentary. Yeah, there's a Netflix show too that does sort of new cutting edge inventions that has that. Yeah, yeah, but this article still didn't say that they have no sex, and they mostly count it down to pornography. And these people will get bored of it. Come on, it's always the same <laughs> thing. So again, I don't. I'm not too afraid about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when people are working in the fields, there might not have been that much either. So yeah. I, I think I disagree with that. I mean, one of the the things that's interesting about millennials and the next generation is that gender is becoming much more fluid, you know, and I think that that starts to transform the human condition or conventional uh, male dominant modes of the human condition. And I, I know that's probably not where you were going, Dirk, but I just, I think that the nature of who and what we are, even as we start to have the capacity to augment our genes and augment you know, different, different elements of our biological function, that that, that that will have a profound impact on what humanity I wonder, does it? Um, um, when was the biome discovered? The inner biome, because that turns out to have been way more influential on people's affect, their thinking, some basic aspects of how we live every day. So we do still eat, but what we eat and how it's and how it influences the way that we sort of interact in the world. Now that we've got this biome research, it turns out. You know, for the longest time, we didn't realize that we have seven trillion creatures living us in us in various ways that are influencing how we uh, how we connect and interact. And now I go, oh, it's a little odd. That turned, how could we have missed something so basic for for so long? Um, and now they're discovering that even in the Arctic, you can find uh, uh, traces of progesterone and Prozac and all kinds of things. I mean, the natural world's kind of gone, and so we're not, <laughs> we've adapted to living on a savanna, and now we're living in a world where all kinds of crazy stuff is sort of coursing through us. So I don't know. I don't know if that counts as fundamentally changing human nature, but um, it's different than it was in East Germany in 1950. So. <laughs> yeah. What is the truth of the human condition? What is the human condition? Is well, it I mean, gender? It's, is it your. You know, okay, it's gender? a speculative question, yeah. so I'm, yeah. you know, no, I'm not Jesus, right? So, <laughs> Or maybe you are. <laughs> it's the only thing, I, 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 if you read 1984, you know, where does it break when he starts an uh, affair with uh, Winston, with this girl, forgot her name. And if I talk to a couple of my East German friends where they clashed and became dissidents, was in personal relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's something they protected. So I think that, and that's why I partly picked this this picture, that I think some essential uh, humanity can be changed, morphed, roles can change, I agree to that. But, you know, for me, male domination is not part of the human condition. It's very much a socially enacted and thing which can come and go and as we see. Um, but I think, um, and we can of course have a very long discussion now what, what the human condition is, but what I mean by this is basic uh, desires, basic needs, basic uh, drives we have that will 
pretty much stay the same and defend its own uh, bodily, physical survival. Mm -hmm. um, I just did you a quick one. Then we've got a couple of waiting hands. But yeah, yeah so I think um, on male domination, Germany has just elected the successor for Chesla Merkel in the party leadership, and she's female. So it's uh, probably the oh. first time that two female leaders will succeed each other in a powerful position. Oh mm. um, <laughs> but that only that says something very different. Now let's not go into German. <laughs> <laughs> But on the on the on the does change she, of mental, do I don't know. <laughs> but on the, on the change of mental, um, uh, not physical, but mental behavior, the simple invention of the like button, I personally believe that in twenty years we will see that that shaped the behavior of a generation. Those that were in puberty or pre-puberty when the like button were invented was invented would have experienced yeah. a lot of their digital interactions way different than those that passed puberty and had more stability when that like button was invented, which either likes you or doesn't like you and abstains. Mm. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Um, I'm going to have got two hands here. I'm going to go to Hightail first. I get you to wrap us up there. Yeah. Uh, so my, my question is, uh, in the discussion you used like a lot, like our history, like history, history, like history, history, like history, like like history, 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 in the government or in the NGO and trying to rebuild narratives and views or manipulate people and, you know, to polarize uh, people's um, action. As researchers, we are kind of uh, communicate something as truth or objective or scientific. I think the artist and the politician are kind of both good at something, at presenting something you know, attractive or presenting something manipulative. And what, what, what can we learn from them, and what, what is our boundary not learn too much from them? Mm. In communicating our ideas. Well, um, it's hard to learn integrity, I guess, in many cases. Personally, I think integrity is going to be extremely important going forward, because everything is uber transparent. And there are some politicians that have a high degree of integrity, but I guess we most of us would agree that not too many do. Mm. And from an artist's perspective, it's maybe less important at this stage because anything is flexible anyway. But I do believe that the whole transparency in the entire debates we saw have very much to do with um, integrity and maintaining integrity at this point for a lifetime, for most of us. Thank you.